All right, folks, we're, we're about to get started. Um, my name's Kanan Harris, if we haven't spoke. I'm the... That's, that's very shocking. Um, thank you. Uh, I am the campus groups manager here at ISI, so if you're at all interested in getting involved with ISI on your own campus or even starting your own society, feel free to reach out to me. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce our next guest, Dr. Michael Breidenbach. Uh, who is, in fact, a former honor scholar himself. Uh, he is an associate professor and chair of history at Ave Maria University, and he is the author of Our Dear Bond Liberty, Catholics and Religious Toleration in Early America, and co-editor of The Cambridge Companion to the First Amendment and Religious Liberty. He has also written for The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and First Things, and has held research positions at Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge, Penn, and Villanova. He obtained a PhD in history from King's College, Cambridge. So please well, excuse me, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Breidenbach. Well, thank you very much for that welcome and uh, thank you to ISI for this very kind invitation um, so that I could be with all of you for this week. Um, I've been really impressed with this um, uh, honors student group, um, and it's brought wonderful memories back when I was an honors student in your shoes many years ago, and so I'm deeply grateful for ISI for making this possible. We are about 15-minute drive to Jamestown, the first early uh, English settlement, permanent settlement in North America. We're also about 15 minutes away from Bush Gardens and the Williamsburg Winery, but maybe we could leave that to the afternoon. Now, I had a chance with my family to visit Jamestown on Sunday. It was an overcast, misty afternoon, exactly the kind of atmosphere I expected um, uh, with that besieged, disease-beset, famished English enclave in its trying early years. Now, setting foot in that environment reminded me of an amazing discovery in 2015. Archaeologists found the graves of four principal leaders of that early settlement. One of the corpses was identified as the remains of Gabriel Archer. What's interesting about this grave is that there was an unusual box placed adjacent to his left leg in that grave. The box is a silver reliquary. This is a Catholic religious object used to store relics and holy water, blood, and so on. This particular reliquary is quite interesting because it's Spanish in origin, and it housed a broken container of holy water as well as the human bones of a purported saint. Now, Jamestown was founded in part as a vanguard against Catholic expansion in the New World. So what is this recognizably Catholic object doing in Jamestown? That question has vexed historians ever since that discovery in 2015. On the one hand, it's possible that Archer saw this box as simply a treasure, right, or perhaps an heirloom from his family that didn't necessarily disclose his religious convictions. Or perhaps he was an Anglican, but thought that holding these reliably Catholic objects was perfectly consistent with his faith. But I think there are several reasons to think that Archer was, in fact, Catholic. His parents were both English Catholics who repeatedly refused to conform to the Church of England and paid penalties for their nonconformity. Moreover, someone must have placed that reliquary next to the remains of Gabriel Archer, and it would be unlikely for a Protestant to do so. Indeed, in the same discovery in 2015, Archaeologists found a handful of Catholic crucifixes. You can see this if you go there in the museum that they have now. Catholic crucifixes of various Catholic countries. Uh, rosaries, in fact. And so it's likely that there was a secret Catholic cell in early Jamestown in 1607. And it gets more interesting. The head of Captain Archer's hexagonal wooden coffin faces east. This is indicative of clergy. The head of the settlement's first Anglican minister, Robert Hunt, also face Easts, and no other coffin does so. So perhaps Archer was a crypto-Catholic priest, maybe a Jesuit. 
in the first Anglican settlement in North America. Now, I tell you this local story um, to prime your historical imagination, to consider what's possible that may go against the grain of the traditional narratives that you've been taught. It should make us reconsider the broader religious dynamics in early America. In other words, the first Jamestown settlers did not compose one uniform sect. They negotiated complex arrangements of religious and civil loyalties. We often think of these pilgrims and the Puritans and, and so on as unambiguously Protestant and anti-Catholic. Perhaps it wasn't so simple. It's likely, actually, given the nature of, of the public nature of burials and the fact that the Jamestown, Jamestown fort was so small that at some point the Jamestown settlers knew of these crypto-Catholic or Catholic filio-Catholics in their midst and tolerated their existence. After all, only 38 of the over 100 first settlers survived that first year. And they needed as many as people as possible to ensure a successful settlement. In other words, religious differences could be put aside when you have Native American raids, a scarcity of fresh water, disease, famine, what's known as the, 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 the um, starving times. At the same time, the fact that Archer and his possible fellow Catholics needed to be secret, or at least semi-secret, about their faith. That fact, of course, is an important reminder that anti-Catholicism was a legal, political, and cultural phenomenon as well that belies any kind of straight line from any settlement. Jamestown in 1607, um, the uh, Puritans up north, whatever it is, to the First Amendment of 1789. So, to answer, or attempt to answer the question uh, embedded in my talk, what are the sources of American religious liberty? What is the path from colonies that formerly legally required religious conformity to religious liberty in the American founding. And before we look at the sources of American religious liberty, we need to have in mind our end, what American religious liberty came to be. Perhaps the most famous articulation of American religious liberty is that it's a natural right. According to this account, human beings as human beings have a natural right to religious liberty a right that exists prior to and regardless of the existence of any kind of government or government at all. It cannot be rescinded. It can be violated. Let me draw an analogy that helps to explain this particular view. Take the example of running. It appears that humans have an innate capacity to run. Of course, we don't run all the time, nor do we all run well. Some of us don't run at all. But there's an internal drive in the youngest of humans, my toddler is a paradigmatic example of this, such that if they can run, they will run. And this often causes their parents distress since parents know that there are appropriate and inappropriate times to run. For instance, it's appropriate to run most of the time in a park, but not near a pool. So while humans have the capacity to run, there are occasions or reasons for running that render the act of running either good or bad. For example, it is a duty to run uh, toward someone to help them uh, in order to save their life, for instance, insofar as that's possible. But it is immoral to run away from the law. And I think it's helpful to understand this view of religious liberty as a capacity in this kind of way. Human beings appear to have an innate desire to seek truths that explain the origin of the universe, to seek what is beyond the physical world, to wonder why there is something rather than nothing. That is, humans have the capacity to seek truths about whether there's a divine being, and if so, how we should order ourselves in accordance with those truths. The fact that some people don't do this, or sometimes for whatever reason can't, is not an argument against the claim that humans as humans have this natural tendency or capacity. In fact, to say that there isn't a divine realm is in itself an exercise of that natural capacity. That's what philosophers call the two-way powers in action theory. Note that this theory is not contingent on a discussion about whether there is a God, what we owe to God, or whether we need to organize our lives around God. Relig religious liberty on this account is a liberty for all humans, even agnostics or atheists, who actually depend on this liberty to form and to maintain their decision as agnostic or atheist. The difference between theists and atheists, in other words, is not that one has religious liberty uh, and one doesn't. It's that one, after actualizing that liberty, concludes in the affirmative that there is a God and 
for the other in the negative. In sum, this view holds that the ultimate source of religious liberty is in nature. We are free to actualize this natural capacity to inquire about the divine and if discover truths about the divine, to order ourselves in accordance with them. Now this is a fairly high level philosophical sketched account of religious liberty. And I think there is historical merit to claim that American founders articulated this natural rights view, maybe fuzzy around the edges, but the core, this core view that I've articulated, um, that they articulated this view and tried to, as much as possible, instantiate it in law. I'm thinking of, say, James Madison, for instance, and the First Amendment. But I think that if our inquiry ends there, we miss the opportunity to think about the very conditions for the possibility of those laws. In other words, what made possible, right? What are the preconditions for getting to something like a discussion in the first federal Congress about the free exercise of religion? We need to think about the texts and contexts that made something like the First Amendment politically and legally possible. In other words, to even have a discussion about it. Right, to think about ways in which uh, we could actually codify it in law. So I think we need to go beyond the First Amendment in that respect to see how local, complex, particular conditions help to shape American religious liberty. Now, I know there's a temptation to avoid this hard, hard historical work. On my worst days, I do avoid it. Systematic, theoretical thinkers, many of whom sit in this room, privilege systematic, theoretical texts. And we are tempted to think that those texts explain political and legal phenomena to core. Hence the obsession with John Locke's letter concerning toleration, James Madison's memorial and remonstrance, and other canonical texts. Although as a historian, uh, we, we wonder why are they canonical? What made them right, uh, part of the Liberty Fund's edition of the Sacred Rights of Conscience, for instance? And I'm not denying the influence of Locke's letter on American religious liberty. I think there are good reasons to think uh, that um, certainly Lockean thinking was part of uh, the, the founding milieu. I just don't think it ex does all the work in explaining our subject and certainly presents a great puzzle for anyone who wants to know, for instance, how Catholics were able to help finalize the First Amendment in Congress or that they were even allowed in Congress at all. So we can acknowledge that ideas have consequences, but still recognize that ideas are not suspended in vacuums that they have histories, and that, more than anything, they are developments of fallible, compromised people who have a set of motivations, prejudices, and pressures that shape how they think about and implement those ideas. So, as I think is made clear, I will approach this as an historian, attempting to unearth sources of American religious liberty that have been neglected. And I recognize that this is a crowded and contested field, so I won't attempt in my remaining time to canvas all the historical sources of American religious liberty. My focus on these neglected sources should not imply that they were the only ones. Now, most students and scholars of American history believe that the cradle of religious liberty in the Atlantic world was, for instance, Roger Williams' Rhode Island or William Penn's Pennsylvania. But the first comprehensive act parse these words very carefully, the first comprehensive act, legislative act, in English, uh, um, British, North America, to protect the free exercise of religion came from what you might think is an unexpected place, a colony in the Chesapeake Bay founded in 1632 by a Catholic, Maryland. Maryland passed the first comprehensive religious toleration act in the Anglophone world by guaranteeing the, and I'm quoting, the free exercise of religion for all Christians. This act was passed in 1649, as I've said. That's decades before the English Toleration Act of 1688-89 and John Locke's letter concerning toleration. By discussing colonial Maryland, I want to make two main points. First, I hope to show at least one of the sources of American religious liberty and how historically complex it was. And second, I hope to show that even though religious liberty is a natural right, even if we stipulate that that's true, its legal protection requires a pledge of loyalty. In other words, we need to pledge our loyalty before we can enjoy our liberty. This observation, I think, has implications for understanding our religious 
liberty controversies today. So our story begins in the early 17th century when hundreds of English passengers boarded the Ark and the Dove to sail the unruly Atlantic waters in hopes of reaching the, the shores of the Chesapeake Bay. Their motivations for immigrating were many. Um, to be sure, a lot of them were interested in the financial prospects of the New World, but they also sought greater civil and religious liberty and the promise of peace symbolized by the names of those two ships, Ark and Dove. During their months at sea, the Protestants and Catholics on board lived in very close quarters, despite the legal separation they faced in England. As the ships left England on November 13, 1633, the Maryland founder, Cecil Calvert, instructed that the Catholic officials, quote, preserve unity and peace amongst all passengers on shipboard, and that they suffer no scandal nor offense to be given to any of the Protestants. He also asked that Catholics on board exercise their religion, quote, as privately as may be, and treat the Protestants with as much mildness as favor as justice will permit, at land as well as sea. Now, compared to the heavy-handed religious policies in England and Scotland at the time, Calvert's religious toleration, de facto, was a welcome change for the voyagers. And after four months at sea, Catholics and Protestants anchored at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. This is March 25th, uh, a date um, uh, relevant for both Catholics and Protestants. Jesuit priest Andrew White celebrated mass, while the new Protestant inhabitants attended their own religious services. Now, this looks like a typical Sunday in America, right, in many parts of, of, of this country. Protestants going to church services uh, over there and Catholics going over there. But in England, Catholics presumed dangerous until proven loyal. Their perceived allegiance to the Pope threatened to subvert a Protestant English empire. Anti-papal impulses coursed through the veins of English law. In other words, Catholics were seen to be outlaws in their own country. So Cecil Calvert, the Catholic founder of Maryland, was embarking on a very dangerous, unique endeavor to bring Protestants and Catholics together peacefully, each respecting the other's religion and right to worship. Needless to say, there were many objections to this experiment. And one of the main objections was that Catholics should not be tolerated at all because they were dependent on a foreign power, the Pope. But Cal Cal Calvert didn't think that the Catholics had such a dependence on the Pope. As long as Catholics pledged their allegiance to the king, they should not be considered a threat. This went against the most important uh, legal text to understand Catholicism in England, the Oath of Allegiance of 1606, passed um, shortly after Guy Fawkes' attempted assassination of the king in Parliament. Now, this original oath of 1606 required uh, people to swear that the pope does not have, quote, any power to depose the king, and that no subject could depose or mur murder the king if the pope excommunicated the king. The pope, in turn, said that any Catholic who swore such an oath would be excommunicated. So Catholics in England were presented with two options, treason or excommunication. Now, each settler in the English colonies was required to take the oath of allegiance before they boarded the ship. In fact, um, I found in, in the archives um, ship searchers who received bounty for every time they tendered the oath to people boarding a ship. And so compliance was exacting, and ships would be detained until every settler swore this oath. So how did Cecil Calvert solve this problem? Well, Calvert wrote in a letter that he was requiring all officials in Maryland to minister an oath of allegiance. And in doing so, Calvert apparently conformed to English law, requiring that settlers pledge allegiance to the king in that exacting way, right, about even papal authority. Yet Cecil Calvert had not specified what oath should be used. He said, writ, he, he said that um, they should swear an oath of allegiance, not the oath of allegiance. Very clever. Now, the next mention of an official Maryland oath was almost five years later in the Maryland Assembly, after they have already settled, an act called Act for Swearing Allegiance. And this new oath avoided all the controversial parts of the original English Oath of Allegiance. It did not mention the Pope, deposing power, excommunication, 
murder. Instead, it focused on temporal allegiance to the king only and his successors. Now, for years, historians have thought that was the end of the story, that Calvert had simply excised those clauses and uh, made that kind of compromise. But I found it in the London archive that he, in fact, redrafted the oath, retaining the original oath clauses that the pope does not have the power to depose the king and that subjects do not have the power to murder their temporal sovereign. In short, Cecil Calvert rejected the view that the pope has the power to intervene in the temporal affairs of England. Now, Rome didn't like this. And there's lots of correspondence between Calvert and secret papal nuncios, ambassadors, and so on, and the king even, um, trying to figure out what oath would be uh, the kind of compromise for both London and Rome. And so he eventually had to excise that, that clause. And so what remained is this simple fealty oath without mentioning the pope's power whatsoever. Now this suspension in holy ambiguity of what Catholics believe about papal authority or its explicit denial was a prerequisite for Catholics to gain religious toleration in England and the colonies. They had to pledge their loyalty to the king, a loyalty that could not be divided in any way with the pope. So this was an important development in American understandings about religious liberty. Cecil Calvert's solution was to decouple political membership from religious belief. Loyalty would be shown not by pledging for or against certain doctrines, religious, but by a simple fealty oath to the political authority, and leave it there. Don't, mention, don't even mention religious doctrines. This was a solution later articulated in the No Religious Test Clause of the US Constitution. When Catholics um, entered the first uh, federal Congress in Federal Hall in New York City, they'd, all they took was an oath that said, we will support the Constitution, which is the same oath we have today for elected officials. It's, it's impersonal, there's no, there's no pledge to George Washington, right? Um, it has nothing to do with religion whatsoever, except the fact that it's an oath, which had been seen to be a kind of religious act, right? Because it's before God. Cecil Calvert's other major intervention in this topic was drafting what became the Act Concerning Toleration of 1649. This Maryland Toleration Act was the first comprehensive law in English history that ensured religious toleration for all Christians. With this act, Calvert had not settled the problem of religious difference theologically, that is, by catechizing or trying to convert those in disagreement, but politically. Religious differences could remain, even intensify, as long as civil peace was maintained. According to this act, all people professing to believe in Jesus Christ shall not be, quote, troubled, molested, or discountenanced for or in respect of his or her religion, nor in the free exercise thereof, nor any way compelled to the belief or exercise of any other religion against his or her consent. Now, since the act protected Trinitarian Christians only, the religion of Jews and other believers remained unprotected under law. There are a few instances of, of, of Judaism in Maryland. Uh, they are not prosecuted for their faith as such. Um, they receive some disabilities socially, but never prosecuted formally under law for their Jewish faith. But as I say, the Maryland Toleration Act does not formally protect non-Christians. The act also mandated fines, imprisonment, or whipping for those guilty of, quote, frequent swearing, drunkenness, any uncivil or disorderly recreation, or by working on that day, Sunday, when absolute necessity doth not require it. Michael McConnell, uh, the, the great judge and, and jurist of religious liberty, uh, uh, thinks of this as a kind of one of the first acts of, of hate speech in early America. Calvert also avoided any language that would, would recognize an established church. The original Maryland Charter by the king decreed that Maryland inhabitants should confess God's holy and truly Christian religion, a statement ambiguous enough to allow for any Christian worship. In practice, Calvert governed Maryland as a broadly tolerant Christian colony without any de jure sectarian establishment. 
The Church of England was not established by law in Maryland during his tenure. The final, government of, uh, the final end of government, in other words, according to Calvert, was not to help his subjects get to heaven by a prescribed path of salvation, but to create the conditions for, quote, mutual love and amity among the inhabitants. As long as his Christian settlers observed a quiet and peaceable government, they were granted religious toleration. Now this liberality came with a potential cost. Acknowledging diversity and granting toleration threatened the social and political cohesion that other English colonies had gained through religious conformity. So to offset this potential loss, Calvert demanded personal loyalty in exchange for tolerating religious beliefs that were not his own. He refused to enforce the granting and protection of religious um, exercise to those whom he perceived as a threat to his power or the peace of the colony. Now, it may seem paradoxical that Calvert required a performance of a religious act, that is, swearing an oath, which invokes God, as a condition for receiving the free exercise of religion. But such was the logic of political authority then. Loyalty came before the granting or securing of any liberties or privileges. Allegiance was Calvert's to receive, and toleration was his to give. Such reasoning had mirrored monarchical thinking, right, of the king's clemency for Catholics in England, and Calvert now applied this to Protestants in Maryland. Now, religious toleration was a tenuous tenure in Maryland. Um, there was a Protestant group that took over government soon after, as well as later conversions of the Calvert family to Anglicanism meant that eventually Maryland did have an established Church of England and denied Catholics uh, uh, the holding of public office, for instance, disabilities that continued up until 1776. But Cecil Calvert's failure to establish lasting religious toleration did not detract from his singular feat of inaugurating this kind of Religious Toleration Act in early America. And it should be noted that his Toleration Act was quickly followed by similar acts in the Atlantic world. Just a few months after the Maryland Toleration Act, for instance, Barbados enacted a Toleration Act. And its offshoot, Suriname, maybe better known as Willoughby Land, named for Lord Willoughby, who um, owned it, followed suit. Then Jamaica, then New York. Now, the influx of Catholic immigrants helped to usher in these toleration acts, as well as the legal flexibility that the col co colonies enjoyed, right? The kind of imperium in imperio that colonies often uh, were, right? A state within a state. Calvert often uh, acted like he's a king within a kingdom. Right? But all that led to extraordinary innovations in church and state in the colonies that people in England, Scotland, and Ireland simply did not enjoy. And the Maryland Toleration Act also was an inspiration for later Maryland Catholics in the New Republic. In the American founding, for instance, two Catholics who lauded Calvert's legacy sat on, uh, in the first federal hall um, and finalized the First Amendment. That's Charles Carroll of Carrollton and, and Daniel Carroll relation. And by the time George Washington became president, he could say that Catholics were full citizens of the United States, entitled to the same protections of civil and religious liberties as all other citizens. He said the same thing to the Hebrew congregation in Rhode Island, to the Methodists, to the Lutherans, and all sorts of religious societies across early America. Of course, there's no straight line from the Maryland Toleration Act to the First Amendment, although some people have tried, especially given the fact that the Maryland Toleration Act says the free exercise of religion. Right, explicitly that phrase. So it's hard to find any straight lines in history except perhaps genealogical charts, so I'm not contending here a straight line. But Cecil Calvert's compromises, denying a church establishment, codifying general religious toleration, rejecting sectarian test oaths, leaving questions about controversial religious views in a kind of limbo, all that more accurately approximates, even though it did not anticipate, the US Constitution's federal church-state settlement than other English colonies did in the North or even England itself. 
So we might reflect on founding father James Wilson's first law lecture in 1790, addressed to the president of the United States, George Washington, to the vice president, John Adams, to both houses of Congress. And this is what James Wilson said. The doctrine of toleration in matters of religion has not been long known or acknowledged. For its reception and establishment, the world has been thought to owe much to the inestimable writings of the celebrated Locke. But while immortal honors are bestowed on the name and character of Locke, why should an ungracious silence be observed with regard to the name and character of Cecil Calvert? Let it be known that before the Doctrine of Toleration was published in Europe, the practice of it was established in America. A law in favor of religious freedom was passed in Maryland as early as 1649. Wilson concluded, with George Washington in the audience, Calvert was truly the father of his country. So let me conclude. You may have noticed that I began talking about religious liberty, and now I'm ending by talking about religious toleration. Although you may have just noticed that James Wilson did the same thing, talking about religious toleration and ending with religious liberty. I've argued that the ultimate source of religious liberty is based in nature, the nature of human beings, and our innate capacity to discover the truths about the divine and order ourselves around those truths. This natural right exists whether or not government acknowledges it or protects it. At the same time, this natural right is effectively meaningless unless a government acknowledges and protects it. And what I think these English and Maryland stories suggest is that the political authority will not acknowledge or protect your liberty unless, in some ways, you pledge your loyalty. This is the regime of toleration, right? That has a, a kind of arbitrariness to it. So I'm not saying that there isn't a natural right to religious liberty, but that governmental protection of that right requires a prior loyalty to the state, however conceived, whether it's the person of the monarch or the imperson of a constitution. This is not just a feature of monarchy, this loyalty before liberty principle. It's also a feature, I would argue, of our republic. Take a look at the naturalization oath, for instance, which has remained the same ever since 1795, right? You, you pledge um, to abjure, disown all previous loyalties to any state, potentate. I can't imagine, you know, uh, I, most people saying potentate, right? Um, but immigrants are required to say this, right? That they, acknowledge, they disavow all allegiance except to the United States. Now the current, and then they get their liberty, right? the protection thereof. The current American jurisprudence of religious exemptions, I think is case in point here. Ultimately, it is the political authority that decides whether a religious observer deserves a religious exemption or not. This puts this natural right discourse in a very precarious context. It's often very thin, even arbitrary, right? About who gets an exemption, who doesn't. But that's the state and part of our jurisprudence on religious liberty. And that looks a lot like 17th century Maryland and not the philosophical ideal of religious liberty that I began with. So we should avoid thinking that the divide cannot be wider or the cuts cleaner between the old world and the American Republic. It is often assumed that the central debates of the old world were theological, while the central questions of the other are putatively political, if such a distinction can be made. I'm arguing that it's much blurrier than that. In other words, the wars of religion, it's argued, softened into the culture wars. But the dominant explanation for this development has been progressive secularization, that Western societies have moved away from superstition to rationality from unthinking dogma to enlightened skepticism, from the barbarism of absolute rule to a new science of politics. Separating church and state and eventually religion from politics followed happily in the wake, or so we're told. The transition from theological to political discourse, right, the way in which we talked about the oath of allegiance as having sort of theological and religious controversies embedded in law and politics, and the way that we talk about uh, how we should have a naked public square, right, this division. Uh, this transition 
has led many contemporaries to believe that they can now relegate religious or theological questions to the dusty attic of antiquarianism. Others concerned with violent religious adherence might sentence religion to a much harsher fate. But the substance and significance of religious disputes have not gone away, even as political regimes, including, in some ways, the most recent iteration of our regime, has tried to quarantine or privatize them. These disputes have simply changed in appearance, undergoing a kind of metamorphosis. The central problem has remained ever since the founding of uh, the early English settlements. What if religious doctrines or religious practice contravene the rule of law as understood by the political authorities therein? What if they undermine the national interest? What if they even threaten the ex very existence of the political regime? Now, this is not just a problem of those Catholic papists in Jamestown or Maryland. It could be about any religious minority that appeals to ecclesiastical authorities or, um, or uh, authorities beyond, outside of the political authority, or is somehow in tension with the political regime. Other religious believers, such as Mormons in the 19th century, Muslims in the current century, have been forced to prove their civil loyalties in light of certain religious teachings deemed dangerous to the polity. The fact that citizens have been denied religious liberty as an historical matter on account of their foreign religious allegiances does not re represent a bug in the constitutional code in America. Loyalty before liberty is a feature of our republic. So thanks very much and look forward to your questions. So thank you very much, Dr. Breidenbach. Uh, I, the question I have is that I think that the sort of the loyalty before liberty is a useful, useful way of thinking things, how things like actually work in practice. But at what point does like the inherent arbitrariness of this become dangerously capricious? Uh, like you brought up uh, Colvert sort of putting his, uh, you having to swear allegiance to him as the basis for uh, toleration. But uh, Calvert has, uh, Calvert had a legitimate, uh, was sincere in his desire for religious toleration in a way that I feel like a lot of the people today who are threatening religious liberty are not. I agree with you. I think, I think basing a regime on a semi-arbitrary um, choice, right, or, or a set of authorities, even if they're ensconced in law, right? I mean, Calvert had a charter from the king. He said that all the power, power his authority flows from the king. Um, even then, when it's sort of legitimate, right, in that sense, um, the decision ultimately to grant toleration to um, all Christians means that non-Christians are not tolerated in that sense. We're not given formal protections. It means that in a very odd turn of, of, of affairs, Protestants actually were more tolerated. There's a case than Catholics were. So there's a case in which uh, a, um, a plantation overseer was accused of proselytizing Protestants in his, in his household and talking about how Protestants are devils and so on and so forth. And he was charged for this, right? Because this is not respecting the kind of uh, civility and toleration of, of Maryland law. Um, the Protestants, by the way, talked about how the Pope is Antichrist, but that was not prosecuted. So for Calvert's calculation, the default was Maryland is in the crosshairs. Lots of people in England did not like this experiment. So we have to default on you know, uh, protecting the toleration um, uh, protections of Protestants, and not as much, actually, Catholics, because there's a general sense in which Catholics are running the show. And so we, we want to eschew the, the objection that this is a papist colony. Okay. So that's just an historical example of the way in which this can be more or less arbitrary of how these things are decided. And so that is a great danger, in fact. I mean, as someone who um, thinks that there is a natural right to religious liberty, uh, I want to instantiate that as much as possible into a constitutional form of government, right, with, with laws that are recognized in the rule of law. Um, but as an historian, I also recognize that that's actually practically how it it, it just doesn't work out that way many, many times. And I can give you lots of examples of the 19th and 20th century to, to show that point as well. So I, I'm, part of the point here is, to, is to, to say, yes, it's dangerous, and that's why all the more reason we should have an approximation of natural rights thinking, 
um, recognizing that ultimately it does require a kind of loyalty to the state or to its laws. That makes sense, thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your lecture. Um, so you discussed about progressive secularization and how we see, we clearly see that in the world today, but we also see just a general rising hostility against the Christian faith. So do you believe that this is a straight rejection of man's valuability and a resurgence of humanism, or like what's your take on that? Yeah, I think we're, we're told a very familiar story, which is that um, there's a kind of progressive secularization, as I mentioned in the lecture, that um, separates ultimately religion from politics, what Richard John Newhouse called the, the naked public square. And um, I think this is a great danger uh, in many ways. One, it's, it's a rejection of the historical uh, um, understanding of what the American founders were attempting to do. Right? The First Amendment is emphatically not what Thomas Jefferson thought it was in establishing this wall of separation of church and state as if these are completely hermeneutically, hermeneutically, hermeneutically sealed um, uh, uh, realms. They interact. Um, one example that I love to give is, is that uh, Congress, the first Congress, um, authorized funds to, uh, um, to pay for Christian ministers, Catholic and Protestant, to educate Native Americans. Right? Um, they saw this as a civilizing effort the Christian ministers obviously saw it as a proselytizing effort, right, with federal money, right? Um, George Washington authorized this, James Madison did, all, all sorts of people said that this was f fully within the realm of First Amendment jurisprudence. Um, so I think that's, that needs to be said, that history needs to be shown to, to combat that, that view. Now, in terms of the, the broader culture of how we see secularization, I think it, I think it does militate against um, religious liberty, because most people don't think in terms of natural rights thinking. They think in terms of um, power grabs, right, and self-identity. And if if religious liberty, if religious identity is just an identity among other identities, then they're seemingly incommensurate until, of course, one identity goes against another, right? So this is what we see with a lot of the Supreme Court cases recently about religious freedom, like Fulton versus the city of Philadelphia, and so on. Um, and I think that needs to be um, argued against as well, because if we just see these things as competing identities, um, that's going to result in some kind of nihilistic calculation about which, which one wins. It's going to be a will to power. Um, and that's what we should avoid. So uh, I don't have a great strategy other than we need all hands on deck. We need the kind of legal case to be made, um, whether on originalist grounds or not, frankly, um, for, for uh, religious liberty, for the, the liberty of the church, as um, Richard Reich uh, mentioned, but also the kind of um, political and cultural and social cases to be made about why religious liberty is important, um, uh, that it is a part of our human dignity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Are we owed religious tolerance in exchange for our loyalty, or is it rather a gift given to us by the benevolence of the state? Yeah, so um, it depends on who you're asking, right, in, 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 in historical cases. Um, I think in the case of Cecil Calvert, for instance, I think there is a general sense in which there is this kind of innate right, um, but uh, he didn't express it in necessarily those terms. Um, and he didn't want this right to go awry, as it were, to subvert his power. He saw that, um, given in the wrong hands, if it's just a, a carte blanche uh, license, right, to, uh, uh, to say anything is a religious exercise, then that would undermine his power. Um, so uh, I think he was, was of the mind that religious toleration is something that is, um, is owed, right, as, as um, at least to Christians. Um, other more, um, you might say, totalitarian thinkers might think that this is something that um, I can give and take away, more or less at will, depending on whether it increases or decreases my power. Right? Um, that's the worst kind of toleration, it seems to me. Um, it's, it's the kind of toleration regime that um, is, is akin to like a CCTV, right? these sort of cameras that are all around today. right? Uh, we don't know whether someone's watching them, but the very fact that these cameras exist mean that we're always in a, in a state of uncertainty. This is the Republican liberty expression. Always in a state of uncertainty about, about our liberty, 
right? And the, the very um, fact that they could watch and then prosecute based on that watching um, means that we are unfree, right? Um, and and that, that is a very um, uh, shocking and disturbing um, uh, uh, environment where at any moment, right, that, that arbitrary power, even though it's not enacting its authority right now, could. And that, that makes us anxiously uncertain about our liberty. Thank you. Hi, so I think you've touched on this a little bit, so I'll try to ask our question in a way that doesn't lead to repetition. Uh, but we were thinking about how Calvert ruled and, um, or governed, I should say, and that law that was very non-neutral and you know, had punishments for drunkenness and swearing. Uh, and there was a lot of laws like that kind of throughout the founding era, and it seems that they were all sort of pushing to inculcate virtue and morality in the public square, kind of with this Christian conception of what the ideal citizen should be. And today we have you know, a greater plur plurality of religions, and a lot of people are rejecting that notion. Uh, and so I'm curious how religious liberty should be reflected in law, and when people are kind of calling for neutrality and equality with all of these different religions, um, is it possible to go back to those laws? Um, and how, can, how should we sort of approach that? So I see in the Maryland Toleration Act, uh, these as separate clauses. And I think there are good historical reasons to think so. Um, there were Protestants who were part of the Maryland Assembly that ultimately passed this act. And I think there's good reasons to think that um, certain uh, more uh, Puritan-leaning Protestants in Maryland inserted those clauses about public drunkenness and, and swearing and, and speech codes and so on into the act. Um, and so in their mind, there must have been some kind of link between religious toleration and civility as they understood it. Um, you're right to say that in early America there are, are these kind of codes up and down the eastern seaboard. And that suggests that there's some kind of um, idea of political membership that has, as it were, preconditions for political um, participation. So in other words, a kind of civility, right? Um, a civility that's informed, of course, by Christianity, in this case. Um, the fact that you should not work on Sundays is a particularly sort of Christian uh, view, that, but is seen as a kind of public civility. And so, um, uh, likewise, drunkenness and, and, um, and so on. The other clause I didn't mention was uh, the, uh, the clauses against saying certain terms. So you couldn't say the word heretic in a pejorative way. I don't know what a non-pejorative way of saying heretic is, but, um, or, or Jesuitical, or Popish priest, or um, roundhead. This is, of course, during the times of the English Civil Wars. I don't have time to get into that, but that's an important context for the Maryland Toleration Act. And so um, there are fines and punishments for uttering words in this way. Um, and, and so I don't know what you all think about that. I mean, in other words, um, we have religious toleration. We also have uh, a kind of cancel culture on, on display here. Uh, you can't, you, you know, you have to be politically correct. You know, Calvert wanted you to be politically correct in Maryland in that sense. Why? But for the sake of peace, right? And I think that's ultimately what undergirds a lot of the political motivation for toleration is, is for civil peace, right? We have to get along. This is, this is a really dangerous endeavor, right? To go thousands of miles away from home and, and set up something different and new. Um, and Jamestown shows that very clearly when you go there, like how difficult it was. And so I'm arguing for a kind of more practical sense in which you, know, you can relate all these things by a general sense in which the end of government is not to get people to heaven, but to ensure their, their civil peace. Right? And that's a very different view than, say, Thomas Aquinas and De Regno or, um, or Protestant magisterial teach, uh, uh, thinkers right? about the proper role of government. Um, so uh, that's a sort of answer to your question. I think um, it really depends ultimately on what, your, what the end of government is. Is it to lead someone to salvation, as you understand it, as a state understands it? Um, is it to give uh, um, some kind of orientation to public virtue? Or is it to leave people in a kind of general state of peace and let them figure out what that is, right? Virtue, religion, and so on and so forth. These are very different visions. And I think in early America, you can see all sorts of iterations of those things. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Good morning. I, I know you've done some work in the past with uh, Dr. Pecknold at COA, so I want to push a little bit from his point of view. Um, for, for Catholics and for Christians, at, at first glance, I think a lot of our theology respects that view a great deal. You know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God, you know, what is God's. But I think at second glance, it's a little more complicated because when we think about, well, everything that belongs to Caesar belongs to him in virtue of God. It's everything is God's, even that which is Caesar's. And, and when we have examples of figures like Thomas More, who says, I'm the, ga the king's good servant, but I die God's first, can we accept a public regime that may ultimately force us to renounce our higher loyalties in exchange for some kind of civil peace? That's a great question. I'm an historian, so I don't go normative. <laughs> uh, I'll go there. Um, thanks for the question. Um, yes, Chad Pecknell is a friend, and, and um, I think you're referencing the conversation we had at the Catholic Information Center about this. And, and, and Professor Pecknold wonders, okay, what do we do with this history? What do we do with the fact that Catholics seem to anticipate, you know, the Second Vatican Council and Dignitatis Humanae and a juridical separation of church and state, the kind of John Courtney Murray view that, that Mr. Reich articulated, right, um, in light of? Uh, long-standing Catholic traditions that seem to suggest otherwise, and this has been taken up by uh, integralists and so on, uh, who are effectively um, trading on medieval doctrines and packaging them for, for a modern audience. Um, I, I should say, just as a parenthetical note, Thomas More's quotation is not the king's good servant, but the uh, uh, God's first, it's and. Mm. And that kind of softens the contrast, interestingly. I know it's often misquoted, and, um, but I think that's an important uh, edit, as it were. Um, what to do about you know, the, the, the kind of Calvert, Carroll, later the Carroll's settlement on this question in light of, um, you might say, the metaphysical picture uh, of church-state unity? Well, um, I think Protestants have their own traditions to um, uh, reconcile these two things. Um, in the Baptist tradition, for instance, there's a strong tradition of, of, of juridical separation of church and state that also sees uh, God's authority as ultimate, right? I'll speak to the Catholic tradition. Um, you know, Pope Leo XIII's modern encyclical, Immortality Day, this is not sort of a medieval, you know, treatise here uh, of 19th century, argues that that church and state is akin to a soul-body unity. That's the ideal. That's what he says. Um, and he gives good reasons metaphysically to, to think that's right. If you continue to read that, it's sort of the middle, right, of, of the encyclical, but if you continue to read, he says that he allows, of course, when political conditions don't allow for this ideal to be instantiated. Um, and so uh, you might think that, in the American case, um, that's, that's where we are, right, um, and that the political authority need not instantiate, you know, the, 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 the true religion and all that's attendant to it um, in a political context. So I think there needs to be, as it were, a, uh, a proper understanding of the principles and the prudential implications that flow from them. Um, and that's what I'll say sort of in general about this question. Um, but it's also important, I should say, that uh, you don't know whether something is approximating the ideal or not until you know what the ideal is. Right? And so you don't know whether it's possible or not possible until you do the metaphysics. Right? Um, so in some ways, the Calvert Carroll uh, settlement um, is, is, in fact, uh, against what Leo XIII's ideal is, to be sure. Uh, and actually, they, they made no um, principled uh, um, uh, argument for church-state unity. It was principled arguments against it. So that's where I would say that um, if you want to know what actual Catholics thought of the American founding, right, and um, not what they would have thought, right, um, they did not buy into this, this, this um, magisterial view. Um, and that, I think that has implications for, for you know, conservative or Catholic um, uh, thinking on these questions today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, okay, so maybe a somewhat similar question to John's, just from a more Protestant perspective. Basically, you know, if someone practices religion as sort of a means to an end, just a way to order one's life, then loyalty before liberty, it's no harm, no foul. It, it's not a problem. However, if one's faith is in God primarily, and that is the actual foundational reference point from which one bases one's life, 
and one views the state in sort of the biblical human nature term as simply a collective of flawed human beings, then is not you know, placing loyalty to the state ahead of the free exercise of one's religion basically the undermining of that true faith? I think there's definitely a danger that it could. Um, I think you're right to, to have that intuition. Um, and I think there are certainly examples uh, in history to, to, to suggest that when someone has uh, an absolute loyalty to the state, uh, that, that um, uh, the state often ends up not protecting any liberty. And I think you know, the 20th century is rife with examples of that. At the same time, I don't know what the alternative is, historically speaking, of a regime that doesn't require any kind of loyalty in the way that I'm describing, but also protects your natural rights. And that's the bargain, this side of salvation. And what I'm suggesting is in the American context, there were ways of, of um, colonial government and American founding uh, thinking and, and practice that tried to, as it were, make it so that whatever kind of loyalty you pledge, it's not gonna be on religious grounds. That's the innovation, it seems to me, that decoupling of the sacral and the secular, right, of, of membership in a political community is absolutely important, right, and innovative. So you're going to have to pledge loyalty in some way, but maybe it's better that we don't have to pledge it in a way that um, confuses, right, the sacral and the secular. So that's why I draw your attention to the no religious test oath clause of the U.S. Constitution. Before, I mean, this is the, this is the first um, non-establishment clause of the U.S. Constitution. Before the First Amendment, right, you have a non-establishment clause. It's called the no religious test clause, right? Because the way that you instantiate establishment, typically, at least in England, is that you prohibit anyone else but your religion to join the House of Commons or you know, uh, the sheriff's office or something like that, right? That's how you ensure religious conformity. Once the US um, constitutional framers prescind from that kind of sectarianism by oaths, well then you've created a space where loyalty is indeed a political um, category and not one that's religio-political. I, again, I want to qualify by saying an oath is a religious act, at least understood by 18th century thinkers. So there's some kind of uh, theistic underpinning Right? Um, but I think that's a very minimal uh, entree into political life. Um, and so, uh, so I think the founders recognize that danger that you're articulating, but you know, it's not perfect. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. I was wondering, um, what justifies what government limits there are upon religious liberty? For instance, there are laws against polygamy um, and more radical views of jihadism but also the fact that there are also allowances made specifically for other um, religious practices, like a Catholic kid can drink alcohol at seven, as long as it's at mass, or substances are allowed within Native American communities that wouldn't otherwise be if it is associated with religious practices. So are the limitations arbitrary, or what specific justification is there for different limitations? Well, no lawyer will admit to arbitrary uh, <laughs> law, right? So um, sort of those who have a constitutional frame of mind, those who have, have trained in jurisprudence and so on, will, as to the best of their ability, try to find principled reasons um, to give religious exemptions in this case, but not that case, to um, affirm a religious liberty uh, here and perhaps not there. And you know the, the, the wealth of case law on church state questions um, shows the way in which Supreme Court justices have um, effectively trying to work this out. Um, and in some ways, these are prudential considerations, right? Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't um, rise the level of, of you, can't have a, you, have, you can't have principles about prudence, right? I mean, this is, it's, a, it's a virtue that requires a, a, a certain disposition and experiences and so on that, that make you a, a prudential judge of, of these questions. At the same time, there are some I think rather reasonable principles that uh, have emerged th for the past hundred or so years on, on religious liberty questions. One of those principles is um, there can't be direct religious animus when passing a law, 
It seems, it seems reasonable. Um, another is it has to be generally applied, right? Um, that also seems reasonable. And that seems to be the other side of the coin of the first. Um, but then we get into, okay, um, it's, it's neutral on the question of religion, right? Um, well, in what sense neutral, right? Can you ever have a, a, a neutral position on, um, on a political question, right? That doesn't have any kind of religious uh, underpinning to it. I mean, what if someone says that the reason why they, they want a certain law is because of their religious convictions, right? Does that make it uh, not a law or not, not admissible, right? Um, so I, I, I don't have a very good answer to your question, I'm afraid. And, um, I think the way the current jurisprudence is right now is leading towards a recognition that churches should uh, be able to govern themselves internally. Um, that seems like a reasonable principle to hold. Um, but what if they contravene civil laws, right? So one example would be uh, a church that refuses to uh, bless or, or, or um, officiate a, a homosexual union, right? Um, when you know these unions are are admissible in law, well, I think you know um, my own view on this is is that if we just see these as a will to power, that's no good, right? So we have to have some kind of uh, uh, measure, right? And I think the religious liberty uh, case for that um, shows to me that that is a, a, a as long as they can go elsewhere, um, that 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 will will as it were. Be, take more precedence, right? That you can't force someone to do something against their religious convictions. Um, that seems like a, a reasonable argument to make. Um, but as I say, um, in, in many ways, um, you have to um, uh, go with the prudential cases. Um. Thank you. Okay, so we still have about 15 minutes, so if anyone has any other questions, you're welcome to enter the queue. Uh, Professor Ferguson. So I, I'm not going to get the details right, but I have two sort of contemporary cases mm -hmm. that I just want to get your take on. Mm -hmm. I believe there was a young man who was a Catholic, young Catholic man, who was arrested for feeding people at the border, or bringing them water and food. I don't know if you remember this case. I feel like it was fairly recent, mm -hmm. a few months ago. And he argued that, he, he was arrested, right? And then he argued that it was his religious obligation to care for the poor and the stranger. <laughs> and so uh, it was a violation of his religious liberty to be told that he couldn't do this, which strikes me as that sort of loyalty versus yeah. mm -hmm. liberty uh, kind of situation. So mm -hmm. I was curious what your take on, was on that. And I'm also curious how we would, I, I, I'm interested in the fact that France, for instance, doesn't recognize Scientology as a religion, right? But America does. And so does that come down to thinking, you know, how, how, that, another, that, that question comes up again about sort of the arbitrariness right, of the decision, right? right? What counts right. as right. a religion and is therefore a matter of religious liberty versus this just isn't a religion and so we don't acknowledge it? Right. Thank you. Um, th those are great questions. And to take the first, um, I think we have to make a distinction between, as it were, what's essential and compulsory when we're talking about religious convictions and practices and what isn't. In other words, um, uh, if uh, no, no religious person, uh, well, I'll just take an example of the Catholic, that no Catholic is required at all times to serve the poor. You know, I mean, um, and so there are cases in which it may not be prudent to serve the poor, right? If your life is in danger um, or if you don't have any food <laughs> to give or something like, in other words, the, um, but there is an obligation to attend Sunday Mass. Right? And so there are canonical designations within the Catholic Church that um, proscribe and prescribe certain things and then leave to, to the prudential judgment of that religious believer what else to do after that. That yes, there's, there's, a, there's an act of mercy right, of feeding the poor, the immigrant, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's not compulsory in, in that strict sense. And so in that case, right, this is why I, I said to the last speaker, you know, it really depends on the prudential case case, um, in that sense, I, I, I would say that, um, uh, that the context is inappropriate. 
right, if you're contravening a law. Now, I, don't, I, I won't speak to that law. I'm just stipulating that that's right, that it's, it's somehow illegal to give food across the board. I, don't, I mean, it sounds kind of weird, actually. Um, but, I mean, it's, it, you're not, are you violating Border Patrol by, like, throwing food over or something? I don't know. But uh, I don't know the particular case. Yeah. But um, there seems to be kind of ways in which you could kind of go around it. But if, if we stipulate that that is, in fact, against the law, um, then maybe the person could, um, you know, donate to a food bank that happens to be across the border, something like that. I mean, in other words, there are, there are reasonable ways to, 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 to um, enact one's religious convictions and not subvert the law. So that's a bit of a dodge, maybe, but that's actually how I think about these things. I think about um, the concrete particulars, right, in light of, you know, the principles involved about, you know, sort of what your Catholic belief tells you to do and what the law of your land is. Um, your second question, could you just remind me, just give me a keyword. Oh, the Scientology. Yeah, Scientology, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so um, it's odd to me that a, a government would recognize a religion, um, especially in light of um, you know, Madison's and Jefferson's view that, that, that this government doesn't have cognizance over religion. Now, a lot is baked into that word, but one of the ways in which I think about this is that, you know, the government, the U.S. government does not have a list of religions in the way that, like, the Chinese uh, government does, right, of patriotic churches, right? Um, and so, to my mind, I don't think the U.S. government has any list of all the religions in the United States. Maybe France does. I wouldn't be surprised, actually. Um, but let's just, let's just say that... Um, uh, you know, um, to go to your, I think, more fundamental question is, um, you know, how do we know what a religion is, right? And therefore, what, to, uh, what are we protecting? Well, that in itself is a philosophical question. And the Supreme Court punts all the time on this question, and it's very frustrating, <laughs> right? Um, it, it, it sort of, um, I think, satisfies itself by saying it's a sincerely held belief. And so then you get the spaghetti, spaghetti monsters uh, religion that puts a spaghetti, um, the, a colander on their head for their like government license photos and say, well, that's my religion, so there, you know. Um, so so I, I I want my driver's license to have a colander uh, in it. Um, and okay, maybe that's not sincere, right? But what about other religions that um, uh, seem uh, sort of beyond? you know, um, what, what you might call, um, you know, traditional religion, and maybe Scientology is one of those. Um, what do you do with them? Um, well, th again, they just th think in terms of sincerely held belief, and so there's sort of evidence gathering about, okay, is there like a membership? Is there like a church? Are they registered? Do they have like some kind of head uh, or, or creedal statement or something like that, right? There's kind of like notions, but what if a religion eschews all that, right? Okay, so what do we do with that? Um, this is where I'm quite sympathetic with um, uh, the, the understanding of jurisprudence that is not just textualist. And I have to say that um, you're gonna have to have some kind of philosophical backing when you make these decisions as a justice. And so my preference, um, I hope this is not will to power, I mean, I, I wanna make a reasoned argument about the way in which religion is ultimately about a higher being. Right, that that's a fundamental thing. And if you, it's not that, that's not like a, a particularly um, actually religious view. That's a natural theological view, right? That you can find in, in um, say uh, uh, Cicero or something like that, um, a religio, right? As some kind of uh, belief in a, a being that's higher than oneself, and as as minimal as that, you might say. And so religion is so sort of the, the 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 organizing way of. Of, of that fact, right? So Zenu, so, Zenu is, it would count. What's that, sorry? Uh, the, the, the higher being in Scientology. Oh, right, oh, I, I see, think. okay, I yeah. Think. Yeah, so, so, so I, I, don't, I don't know too, I mean, I'll have to ask Tom Cruise uh, um, more, but I, I don't, I don't uh, that seems plausible then. So if they have a sense of, of, of higher being that is, is somehow um, uh, uh, meaningful, right, to, to our existence, then, then yeah, that would count, I suppose. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Uh, so my question is, in an age where secular liberalism has detached natural rights philosophy from um, its current defense of religious liberty, how, um, 
what are some ways that you see the conservative, what are some concrete things you believe that the conservative movement should do to fill that void that we've seen uh, being filled over the past 70 years through identity politics and other ways of interpreting the law and treating religion? Yeah. Um, so the question, uh, in a sense, is one of strategy, right, and, and, and rhetoric in, in some ways. Um, I, I think there, as I said before, there has to be all hands on deck, right? All sorts of arguments have to be um, positioned. Um, and I think in terms of, uh, to your point about the conservative movement, um, you can use the principles that Russell Kirk articulated, the six canons, right? The, the number one thing is a recognition of transcendence, right? And to motivate that intuition among people who may not be disposed to it, um, you know, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Um, I think metaphysics, right, um, of, 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 of sort of a, of a very basic kind of metaphysics of, you know, so why do you think there's something rather than nothing, right? And go, go sort of really high level and see, see where that takes you, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that doesn't, those kind of metaphysical conversations don't really trigger identity politics. It's very difficult for someone to say, oh, you believe there's something rather than nothing because your identity. That just seems absurd, right? Um, it's much more likely to say, oh, you believe there's something rather than nothing because you know, you're a Baptist or something, right? So no, no, look, let's just have a philosophical conversation about this. Um, so that's one strategy, to actually engage in a kind of high-level analysis. The other is to appeal to their historical imagination, right? And uh, the way that I've tried to do t today, um, to show the way in which um, this country was not just built by slaveholders and, and so on, although they were, but also people of, of, of religious conviction um, that did secular things well, right? Um, and yeah, they used sort of religious arguments, um, but you know, a lot of the institutions that we have today that secularists would, would see as good you know, um, were built by religious people, and they, th they thought that their religion was really important and essential. And so, you know, what's, what's so funny about um, uh, a lot of um, progressive uh, action today is that they, they are in previously, previous seminaries, effectively, you know, like Harvard and Yale, and the College of New Jersey, and, um, you know, all these were um, uh, uh, seedbeds for theological, uh, specific theological uh, training. And so um, maybe they don't care about that. Um, but it seems to me that uh, you can only understand these elite institutions in light of, right, their religious convictions, right? Um, so there's lots of different ways we can, we can talk about this, um, but I think also a sense of, of, of maybe an appeal to fairness or something like that too might work. Um, but ultimately, if we're just talking about activists right here, we're just talking about power, and so, um, you know, I think, I think that's a much more difficult uh, situation to deal with. Thank you.